In this video, I will explain how human behavior and thinking can be approached in several very different ways, and how these different approaches simultaneously illuminate the same subject, each adding more to our understanding of how the human mind works and why we behave the way we do. My name is Jouni Vilkka, and this is my channel TFF Teacher from Finland. Please subscribe and click the thumbs up button. There are different approaches to studying how humans function. I describe them here as different levels of psychology, based on what aspect of human psychology they study, because those levels are layered on top of each other. You'll soon see what I mean. As we are biologically speaking animals, it stands to reason that we can also be studied as such. Biological psychology, or biopsychology for short, looks into the biological foundation that enables us to think, solve new problems, speak and create cultures, and so on. Things like our neural and hormonal systems of regulation can explain a lot about our behavior and how we function at a fundamental level. An evolutionary perspective can also explain why we might have certain features or tendencies. Genetics certainly seems to have a lot to do with such things. Another approach focuses on how the individual person's mind or psyche works on the mental level, thinking conceptually and experiencing emotions. We can think consciously, using our cognitive abilities to perceive problems, discuss them with others and solve them, among other things. Cognitive psychology studies our mental abilities and the schemas structuring our thinking. Thoughts, emotions, the influence of subconscious desires on our behavior, the relationships we had with our parents while growing up, and all that. This is probably what most people associate with psychology. This level of psychology depends on the biological basis that makes all these functions possible. If we go up to the next level to see what the psychological functioning of an individual makes possible, we come to the social level, studied especially by social psychology. We are affected even by our non-human environment. Think about how your mood can alter depending on your surroundings. Even more significant are of course our relationships with other people, the groups we belong to. The social dynamics within and between groups are extremely important. Peer pressure and tribalism may explain a lot about what happens even in our societies more broadly in politics, say. The final level of abstraction, even above social, is the cultural. Values, worldviews, cultural schemas and such things affect everyone within a culture, and different cultures can be defined and compared. What motivations we have, how we express emotions, what kind of social structures are possible, all these things depend on culture. All the aforementioned levels of psychology are simultaneously influencing our thinking and behavior, whether we like it or not, so it makes sense to also study those effects on our psychology. I will now give some examples of how certain phenomena can be approached in these different ways to increase our understanding of the phenomenon. How would you study the experiences children have at the summer camp, for example? It could be possible to take a biological approach and look into the physiological side of the experiences by monitoring things like blood pressure, heart rate, and signs of stress hormones in blood samples, for example. Another approach would be to interview the children at the time, soon after, or after a longer period of time, or all the above, to see how the kids describe their experiences how they remember the camp, what they remember, and what they forget, and so on. The ways the children construct a narrative of their experience 
uh, could tell us something about how they think. It would also be possible to study uh, the influence of other people on the children, as well as the formation of social bonds, groups and interactions between the groups. This could give us ideas for preventing bullying and how to improve social cohesion in a positive way. Finally, the significance of things and the forms of expressions uh, used or limited or even banned at the camp could be analyzed as cultural constructs. We could study similar camps in different cultures to bring out what actually seem like cultural differences and similarities between the groups of different cultures. Motivation is the combination of all the various motives affecting the subject at the given time. We typically have different motives, some of which contradict each other. You might want a job that pays well, but you also don't want to spend a lot of time at work, which that well-paying job might require. You might want to work out to get big and strong, but you also don't want to spend a lot of time at the gym, don't want to get sweaty and so on. But if you have a lot of strong motives for doing something, it doesn't matter so much if some of your less powerful motives are opposed to it you will still be strongly motivated and be able to do that thing. Different kinds of motives can also be grouped depending on the level of description we are interested in. Biological motives would include hunger and thirst, the need to sleep, sex drive and so on. Mental motives could include curiosity and the need for intellectual effort, appreciation of beauty and impulse for artistic creativity. Social motives have to do with the need for human contact and belonging, feeling important and respected, lust for power, caregiving and sexuality. Culture influences all mental and social motives through concepts, values, norms, customs and such. The need to eat is biological, but how we satisfy that need depends on the culture we find ourselves in. We probably don't eat alone, but with co-workers, friends or family, and we have personal preferences about what we want to eat that may have to do with what we grew up eating, how we express our identity and so on. Abraham Maslow is famous for his theory about the hierarchy of needs. The idea is that our motives for behaving the way we do are caused by our needs, which can be categorized and placed into a hierarchy. The point of the hierarchy is that, according to Maslow, we fulfill our needs in a certain order. Only once we have fulfilled our basic needs do we feel higher needs. These needs are often depicted as a pyramid, with the physiological needs at the bottom as the most basic needs we need to fulfill before being pressed by needs having to do with social interaction. On top of the pyramid is the need for self-fulfillment. There are actually eight stages in the structure, but this is enough to give you the basic idea. There is a difference between two kinds of needs, according to Maslow. Deficiency needs are caused by being deprived in some way. Of these, basic needs like physiological needs and safety needs are obvious, but they also include mental needs of belonging and love, as well as that of esteem. The last of these includes the need to feel accomplishment and prestige. The lower in the hierarchy the need is, the more necessary it is, and thus the more pressing the motivation to fulfill it. If you've ever been really thirsty, you probably agree with this. The other kind of need is higher up on the hierarchy. Growth needs are about psychologically growing as a person, achieving one's potential. It can be about expressing oneself artistically or otherwise going after one's personal goals. The theory has needed some revision since Maslow presented it. 
Apparently, the order of the needs varies somewhat from person to person, and some people consider higher needs more pressing than some needs lower in the hierarchy, as presented. The theory cannot be used to predict behavior. It is still perhaps useful in expressing something about the structure of needs and their importance. The framework is used in some academic fields like sociology and sometimes when making decisions about social policy. For example, Finland is pretty famous for effectively dealing with homelessness. The guiding principle that led to significantly improving the situation is called housing first and is based on an idea that is at least similar to Maslow's. You can't deal with the other problems unhoused people have unless you first take care of that most pressing concern and get them housed. That has been a very successful strategy in reducing homelessness and other social problems as far as I know. Joy, sorrow, hate, disgust, surprise and fear are called basic emotions because they can be found in all cultures and are expressed with the same expressions and gestures. Even those born blind use the same expressions for expressing them, even though they cannot have learned those expressions by watching others. Secondary emotions are typically more complex combinations of the basic emotions. Jealousy, for example, can include fear, sorrow and hatred. Such emotions are more culturally varied. Some emotions are specifically social, such as embarrassment, pride and shyness. Emotions vary in intensity. Some are felt more strongly than others. Valence. Some are pleasant, others distinctly unpleasant. And duration. Some last only for a second, while others could stay with you for a longer time. Note that mood is not an emotion, but a long-term general state of feeling that fluctuates with emotions. For example, a person can feel very down most of the time due to depression, but still be able to have a brief moment of joy. The biological basis of emotions is reflected in the physiological reactions that are connected to them, such as changes in pulse and breathing, sweating and so on. The mental level of description covers one's own interpretation of the emotion, which has a lot to do with how one experiences the emotion. The social aspect of emotion can be seen in the regulation of emotions and their expressions in social relationships and situations. The cultural level usually limits how emotions are supposed to be experienced and expressed. For example, there are stupid norms stating that boys don't cry. A high-pitched scream is unmanly. Women are caring. Um, the widow should express sorrow for at least one month, but no more than a year. And so on. Basic cognitive functions include perception, attention, memory, thinking, language and learning. Higher cognitive processes include at least creativity and problem solving. Certain changes in the brain obviously influence cognitive functions. Alcohol and some illnesses may temporarily alter one's perception and ability to function well. Injuries and simply one's development while growing up or aging can also cause very significant changes in one's cognitive abilities and even be disabling. Ancient philosophers already knew that strong emotions, affects, influence thinking, typically making it more difficult. Mood also affects cognitive functions so that a positive mood improves learning and memory, as well as directing and sustaining attention. The social situation also directs attention and shapes the interpretation of the situation. 
Other people can influence one's emotional state merely by virtue of being present. Culture has a subconscious influence on our worldview, as well as providing us with our language, of course. Thus, the concepts we use are clearly influenced by culture, but also so is what we pay attention to. A human is a whole made up of various aspects, some of which are biological, others mental, social or cultural. We grow up within a culture and by being socialized into groups, learn to express ourselves in it. Fundamentally, all these things are also influenced by our biological nature, with all the needs and desires that creates. Those needs and desires are mediated by our mind or psyche, which is molded by individual experiences, the concepts we learn and the social environment we mostly inhabit. All these things are so intertwined that none of them can be really isolated and separated from the influence of the others. Still, the study of the human mind and human behavior can take different approaches, focusing on the biological, the mental, the social, or even the cultural. In the videos that follow, I will focus on each of those approaches in turn. See you then and bye for now. If you wish to support my channel, please click thumbs up, subscribe and share my videos. Any comments on the videos would also be welcome.